the United States of America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. For centuries, this country has represented hope and opportunity for millions looking to build a new life. But a decade after 9-11, are Muslims still welcome here? I'm Sam Farah. I come from Lebanon, where the different religions fought a vicious civil war. In a country where freedom of worship is enshrined in law, I want to find out whether America's Muslims are now seen as an enemy within. I just don't agree with their beliefs. That is pure, unadulterated evil. I was born in this country, so what country are they talking about for me to go back to? I'm Karen Zarendast. I grew up in Iran, where Islam is imposed on the population by the state. For me, America always symbolized freedom, hope and choice. But what is it like today for those who choose to follow Islam? I don't think they're necessarily concerned that I pray five times a day. They're more concerned on, are you going to, you know, blow up? Are you going to kill me, bro? We're just regular Americans. Together, Sam and I have traveled the length and breadth of the United States. From Manhattan Island, she's the urban city hijabi with pizzazz. To Houston, Texas. From the smokestacks of Detroit to the palm trees of California. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We've been meeting Muslims from all walks of life to find out what it means to be a Muslim in America today. Orange County, California. A Muslim charity's fundraising dinner is surrounded by right-wing activists. Their message of bigotry and intolerance is one that many may find deeply offensive. This is what Islamophobia looks like today. For the Muslim families caught in the middle, it was a terrifying experience. When we were walking in there, right, I, for the first time in my life, I felt that something physical might have happened. At one point, it felt like someone was going to throw something, you know, be it a stick, a rock, or, you know, I mean, you know, someone could come out and point a weapon at you. They hold up signs and stuff like, get off of our land. Get off of our land. And they also called us terrorists. I was born in this country. I live in this country and I also go to school in this country. So what country are they talking about for me to go back to? Earlier that day, local politicians had held a rally to protest against the Muslim event. Those who wish to take our country away from us can be seen all around us. Some can be clearly identified as the enemy. They call it multiculturalism and it has paralyzed too many of our fellow citizens to make the critical judgment we need to make to prosper as a society. I have a wonderful 19-year-old son who's a United States Marine. As a matter of fact, I know quite a few Marines who will be very happy to help these terrorists to an early uh, meeting in paradise. To actually be on the receiving end of the hate, you know, it's just, it's horrible, you know. And at this stage in my life, because I'm a mother, and I, I have to care for my children, and I worry about their future, what more is to come? I love the United States. My family even moved here from Iran. What happened in Orange County was really shocking. I wanted to know if this was an isolated incident or part of the daily reality for Muslims living here. Back in the 80s, when I was studying here, being an American Muslim simply wasn't an issue. So how has this country changed since 9-11? The upsurge in anti-Muslim feeling started here, at Ground Zero. 
September 11, 2001. Ten years ago, the United States suffered the most deadly terrorist attack in its history. America went on the offensive. This nation is at war with Islamic fascists who will use any means to hurt our nation. A decade later, Osama bin Laden is dead. But the war on terror grinds on. Back where it all started, we were allowed into Ground Zero to look at the reconstruction firsthand. It was an emotional experience, visiting the exact spot where 3,000 innocent people had died. For many Americans, this is a sacred place, and 9-11 has defined their country's relationship with Islam. What happened here 10 years ago means a lot to the rest of the world, means uh, a lot to Muslims who live in this country, and to Muslims who live elsewhere. It's just got so much significance. And this is where the whole debate about you're with us or you're against us, this yeah. is where it all started. Yeah. Building the new tower, bigger and better than before, is a matter of national pride. But the psychological and emotional scars left by that dreadful September day are taking much longer to heal. For some, the words Islam and terrorism have become intertwined. And 10 years on, many American Muslims say that, for them, things are actually getting worse. This is Republican Congressman Peter King from Long Island. Earlier this year, he started a series of security hearings into homegrown Islamic extremism in the United States. Al-Qaeda is attempting to radicalize the Muslim American community. So they are now recruiting from within the country and they're looking for people who are under the radar screen, people who are living here legally, people who are citizens, people who have no known terrorist activity. King says ordinary American Muslims are not doing enough to combat terrorism. I will have people from the Muslim community who will say how when they went to law enforcement, how imams attempted to stop them, how they were threatened when they did want to report, when the FBI began investigations, how the imams in their mosques told them not to cooperate. Karen and I traveled out of New York to the suburb of Long Island for Friday prayers. We wanted to ask Muslims in Peter King's own constituency about his accusations. There was an amazing diversity in the congregation. 36 different nationalities, from Arabs to Chinese, were present here. They realized they were a community under extreme scrutiny. And that radicalization that they're blaming on us is not the radicalization of the Muslims, but the radicalization is coming from outside against the Muslims. Many of the locals were unhappy that their congressman was focusing on the Muslim community as a potential problem. To single out one religion or one religious community and, and entirely put the focus on, on them, um, I, I feel is unfair. Where's the proof? Where's the beef? You're just, it's just baseless accusations. Are people going to you know, uh, look at me different? Am I going to get attacked? You know, you're, you're always worried about your safety. I feel afraid about my, my, my kids. The congregation in Long Island seemed stunned to be accused of disloyalty. But was it just a sign of the times? Back in New York, I met with Steve Rendell, a media analyst who monitors the portrayal of Islam. He told me he was seeing a lot of prejudice. There is a torrent of Islamophobia in, in the United States, coming from talk radio, coming from the right-wing cable television, coming from this sort of the fever swamps of the right-wing blogosphere. Not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslim. Islamic radicals, the new Nazis, want you dead. I think that both Islamophobes and the politicians who exploit anti-Muslim bias in the United States do conflate being Muslim with being a terrorist. This is, this is the power of their message. This is what puts their opponents on the defensive. It's really very similar to 
anti-Semitism or anti-Catholic bigotry. Bigotry always works the same way. It's dehumanizing members of a group and assigning to them negative traits. I have always thought one of the best things about America is its guaranteed freedom of speech enshrined in the Constitution. For better or worse, that means both sides in an argument have the right to say what they want about each other. Here, amidst the neon of New York's Times Square, we found someone whose response to bigotry is to encourage people to laugh at it. Look, if you hate all blacks, all Jews, all Arabs, all Latinos, you're a racist. But if you're afraid of certain people in certain situations, you're just a white person. <laughs> and I'll be brutally honest, you see four Arab guys at a deli in New York speaking Arabic, you don't care. You see four Arab guys about to board your flight speaking Arabic to each other. <laughs> you run for a black guy, you used to be afraid of a protection event. <laughs> Comedians like Arab-American Dean Abedallah use humor to highlight and undermine intolerance. He told me he thinks anti-Muslim feeling is at a new high and has even become acceptable in mainstream society. I think it's probably the most challenging time that I have ever experienced. There's the most people I've ever seen demonizing Muslims, and they use the term Arab and Muslim interchangeably. Uh, people no longer is at the extreme right that was doing it a short time after 9-11, now it's become part of mainstream discourse. If you make a comment about blacks that's racist, you'll probably be fired or suspended from your job. If you make a comment about Jewish people that's anti-Semitic, you will probably lose your job or be suspended. If you make a comment about Muslims, you don't get fired. In fact, your ratings go up, you sell more books. It's become a boutique industry. Boom, chicka, boom, chicka, boom, 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 boom. Back outside in Times Square was Brother Dash, an African-American Muslim poet from New Jersey. Struggle, struggle, love and hate. Argue, argue, just debate. You said this, well, you said that. Tit for tat and tit for tat. Boom, chicka, boom, He told me that bizarrely, the election of Barack Obama had also increased the negative debate around Muslims. What has happened with the election of Obama, you cannot be an overt racist. You can't come after Obama on him being black. What seems to be okay is you can be quote unquote racist overtly uh, towards Muslims. So you can attack Obama on the basis of him having had a Muslim father who ended up becoming an atheist actually. Uh, him growing up for a few years in Indonesia and, and, and then you just sort of uh, stoke these, these underlying uh, issues uh, with Obama, uh, and you use the Muslim thing uh, as your excuse, your way to vent that racism in a way that is quote unquote acceptable. Dash told me that regardless of the debate about Obama, Islam and racism, there's every reason to be positive about being both an American and a Muslim. My ancestors helped to build this country just as many others have helped to build this country. So what you see in Times Square to me we help build this. We help make this, this possible. I admired Dash's optimism. One of the things I love most about America is the sense of hope and belief in the ability to make something of yourself. Kavachi is a Manhattan-based fashion designer who has created a range of high-end Islamic couture. To practice their Islamic religion more freely, her family moved to the United States from Turkey. Turkey is a Muslim country, however, because church and state are separate, kind of like France, you're not allowed to practice your religion at school or in a governmental building. So you moved out of Turkey to the US so you could practice Islam? Exactly. We migrated so we can practice our religion with freedom in the US. And can you? Yes. Yes, the land of the free, we can. If I choose to wear my hijab and uh, it's not a problem at work, at school, anywhere you go in the US, uh, they respect you for your individuality and your beliefs. All right, folks, wanna look at me? When I lived in Iran, I associated the hijab with dark colors and lack of choice. But at a fashion shoot in Central Park, Elif's girls were Muslim, loud and proud. This photo shoot is about uh, the urban city hijabi. Uh, she's ready to go out uh, in the city in her nice 
stylish hijabi clothes with pizzazz. Okay, now here we go. Her business is booming. In fact, Muslim women in the United States have levels of success and visibility unmatched elsewhere. Elif says this is because the educational and business opportunities for women are much greater here than in majority Muslim states. The U.S. was more of an option compared to moving to an Islamic country. Still, you have to face lots of discrimination and other issues. Elif found economic and religious freedom in Manhattan. But New York City is one of the largest, most liberal and ethnically diverse cities in the United States. And most Americans do not live in places like this. So how is life different for Muslims living in a small town in the Midwest? Out west near the tri-state border with Kentucky and Indiana lies the city of Carmel in southern Illinois. Population 5,500. It's a typical slice of small town USA, self-styled as the place where northern vigor meets southern hospitality. Agriculture, coal and small oil fields provide the main sources of income. Sure. The people here say they believe in hard work, family, community and religion. The religion in question being Christianity. There are no less than 17 churches in Carmel. But in amongst the community of the faithful is a lone Muslim family. Dr. Zahid Saqib has been a family doctor since arriving here from Pakistan 32 years ago. He's a pillar of the local community. He's a friend and neighbor as well as a doctor. He's well respected in this community and uh, we're glad to have him here. He's just like one of us. In a small town like Karmai, uh, I think people have been extremely nice to me. It's a country of immigrants and I think that most of the people do remember that. But occasionally I do have to remind them that yes, I'm an immigrant, just like your father or great-grandfather or the one before that came to this country and he struggled but he made it and I am one of those people that came a little bit later so occasionally I have to remind them about that when they get uh, you know I'm an American you're not. Dr. Saqib's wife Bushra took us on a tour of Karma's commercial hub Main Street. So when you walk in this town, you see churches everywhere. Uh -huh. As a Muslim family from Pakistan, uh -huh. what's it been like living here? Um, actually, most of the people have been very welcoming. Actually, I've been invited to the churches a lot of times, you know, to come speak about Islam, about Pakistan. So this feels like home now. Bushra has raised six children. Her conservative values meant that she, like many Muslims in the United States, was a natural Republican Party voter. But after September 11, 2001, all that changed. Uh, America got attacked, 9-11 happened. Yes. Why did you change from Republican to but Democrat? See, um, I felt like Republicans were not accepting of Muslims. You know, they were demonizing Islam. I feel like I'm defending my religion all the time, you know, to people. I worry about the children, how every day Islam bashing is going to do to them. Do they want to be stand-up Muslims, you know? Can they handle all the pressure? And the pressure has certainly come out into the open during some heated encounters over the building of new mosques. Most famously, a scheme to build an Islamic center near the site of Ground Zero ran into virulent opposition. But such scenes have been repeated across the country. Islam is not a religion. It's a political organization. I just don't agree with their beliefs. You don't want to see a mosque? In Hell no! The mosques are used to call its members to insurrection and jihad. Karmai's nearest mosque is some 50 miles away across the state line in Evansville, Indiana. Local Muslims, including the Saqibs, had designed and built it themselves eight months ago. It's their pride and joy. And it serves how many families? Uh, approximately 200 families in the tri-state area. 
Some Muslims think that this is a hard time to be a Muslim in America. This is a hard time to build a mosque like this. How do you feel about that? Is this a hard time to be a Muslim? We thought so, but I think we are presently surprised at the community in Evansville. And they have really not objected to it. Many groups come in, school, children, college students, all of them. And if they don't know about the real Islam and they equate terrorism with Islam, then it's our job here to educate them. And the best way to educate them is to, to know them and let them know you. And if we do that, then their prejudices are going to be much less. The Islamic community here is small. Perhaps one reason they choose to reach out to their neighbors. But Muslims tend to favor large families. The Saqibs themselves have six children. And so the demographics are changing. There are some very large Muslim communities in the United States. The biggest of all is near Detroit, in the city of Dearborn, Michigan. About 30,000 of the local population are Arab Americans, and most of them are Shia Muslims who can trace their roots back to Lebanon and Iraq. It was all a far cry from Karmai. The Muslim population here was in the tens of thousands and much more assertive. My guide here was Ron Eamon, an ex-cop whose grandfather originally came here from southern Lebanon. To me, Dearborn seemed like a slice of my home country, transported halfway across the world. Ron, I feel like I'm in the Lebanon of my childhood. All this food, this is brilliant. Some of these uh, dishes are uh, prepared the same way they've been prepared in Lebanon for over a hundred years. Ron told me that while there was strength in numbers, the growing size and assertiveness of the Arab American population nowadays had brought more scrutiny, much of it negative. Yeah, things were better uh, back then because uh, we were pretty much just a shadowy uh, part of the population. Um, now, um, we stand out. Uh, now there's Dearborn, Michigan. 35% um, of the population uh, Arab Americans. Um, 11 mosques. There are a lot of people in America that uh, would rather uh, Arabs weren't living here. Uh, certainly Muslims. And one of them is Michigan-based lawyer and right-wing blogger Debbie Schlossel. She derides the area, calling it Dearbornistan. Muslims in America, I would say the majority, do want America to become a, an Islamic nation. When you see Muslims flying planes into buildings in the name of their religion and murdering 3,000 Americans, and then we are told by the general Muslim population that this does not represent their religion, that this is just a group of hijackers who supposedly hijacked the religion. Uh, it's just not true because, in fact, we see attack after attack on Americans. There have been a number of plots and lethal incidents involving American Muslims wanting to kill their fellow Americans. Thirteen people were shot dead and more than 30 injured by a gunman at Fort Hood, Texas. A car bomb planted in Times Square was designed to strike at the heart of the city, but failed to detonate. For some, examples such as these show that the religion itself is inherently violent. Unfortunately, that seems to be the dominant strain of Islam. Not that all Muslims do these things, but that they morally support this and they don't speak out enough against it. This is the Islamic center of America. It's the largest mosque in Dearborn and the largest in the country. Sayyid Hassan al-Qazwini is the imam here. I asked him whether he thought Muslims were being radicalized in U.S. mosques. And if so, what could be done about it? I admit that there could be some imams preaching hatred here and there, but there are pastors who have been preaching uh, hatred as well. Let's face it. However, what we can do is to educate our congregations so they have been able to distinguish true 
peaceful divine religion that was revealed to Prophet Muhammad than a self-proclaimed religion that is being taught by certain uh, terrorists and extremists here and there. Like many Muslims, people here think that American foreign policy, especially its strong support for Israel, is the root cause of tensions between Islam and the West. Some Americans can't tolerate any criticism of Israel, and for them, displays of support for overseas groups is clear evidence of disloyalty to the US. I watched during the Israel-Hezbollah war, I watched as 10,000 Muslim residents of Dearborn demonstrated in the streets in support of Hezbollah and Hamas. Um, and Hezbollah is this terrorist group that murdered 300 U.S. Marines and uh, U.S. Embassy officials in Beirut when they attacked us. We do have Lebanese roots and, and, and connections. We have connections with the Muslim world. But that does not mean at all that we have any affiliation with any group. I believe when the United States stands unconditionally and blindly with Israel, it is against the interests of the United States. But if I say that, that doesn't mean I am not loyal to this country. Indeed, my love for the United States makes me to say that. But Qazwini knows it's not street politics that influence elections here. He told me American Muslims had much to learn from other minority groups. If we Muslims know how to understand and to be part of the system, uh, whenever we learn the, the, the art of lobbying and, and, and influencing uh, politics through our vote and through our wealth, just like the Jewish, community is lobbying for its causes, then we will be able to change the policy of the United States. It struck me that once American Muslims were able to crack mainstream politics in this country, the game could change. I don't want people who go to that mosque deciding what my members of Congress, what my senators, what my president is going to do in terms of not just foreign policy, but domestic policy. We left Dearborn feeling U.S. foreign policy was a hugely divisive issue that often seemed to put America and Islam on opposing sides. And it's that that's led some to question the loyalties of American Muslims. Rajai Haki's family originally came from Syria. He was a student when 9-11 happened. Determined to fight for his country, he quit college and joined the United States Marine Corps. Rajai ended up in Iraq on the front line of the Battle of Fallujah. I was really excited. I mean, I was really ready for it because it, I was angry. We were all angry. You know, we'd, been, we'd lost men in our battalion and it was time. And we went in there with full force. And it was, I'll tell you, it was, it was, it was the most intense experience of my life. Rajai's main role was as a Marine Corps interpreter. <laughs> fighting Arab insurgents. I never framed it in the sense that, oh, you know, I'm an Arab fighting my own people. You know, I didn't really think of it in that way. I just thought, you know, I'm a Marine doing my job. We've got the enemy right where we want him. He's coming to us and we're killing him. But as the Iraq war dragged on, Rajai became increasingly disillusioned and he began to question his country's motives. Our war became, you know, fighting the insurgency and it wasn't about liberating Iraq anymore. It wasn't about helping the people anymore. It was just about fighting the insurgents. Check me up. Rajai now feels America's global war on terror has proved an horrific blunder that served to increase the hatred of America in the Middle East and has had a lasting impact on the way that Muslims are seen at home. All of the, the damage that we've done in the Middle East and in, in the Muslim world and the perception that, that we have created of our being against Muslims, we're, we're really just damaging our relations with the Muslim world and with the Muslims in America. 
But just how damaging has the fallout been for Muslims living in America? How pervasive is the mistrust? Our next destination was Texas, the Lone Star State, where the locals claimed they like to do things bigger and better than any place else. This is the Kangaroo Crew, an elite medical unit from the world-famous Texas Children's Hospital. They rescue sick children no other facility in America is capable of treating. The emergency pediatrician on today's call-out is Dr. Seema Jilani. To cover the vast state of Texas, the kangaroo crew don't just drive specially equipped ambulances, they have their own jet plane. Seema is well respected by her colleagues here in Texas. But when she was applying to other medical schools in the immediate wake of 9-11, she encountered Islamophobia even from highly educated fellow Americans. After 9-11, I went and did all of my medical school interviews. I always asked questions like, well, your, does your dad teach you how to make bombs in your backyard uh, or in your garage? Do you plan on wearing a burqa when you practice medicine? There was a gentleman that also told me that I was the reason that women in Nigeria were stoned to death every day. To me, it was a big slap in the face because I had rehearsed questions about why do you want to be a doctor? and uh, what do you want to do when you grow up? But in America, at least I had recourse to say, you know, this is not right. And my family often, you know, when I complain about these things, they'll often tell me, well, if this had happened in Pakistan, that recourse would not be there. So these are the reasons we've come here. She's adorable. She your first? Yes. Wonderful. Seema herself was born in New Orleans, but her parents immigrated to the United States from Pakistan in the 1970s in pursuit of their American dream. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. Reg Jilani has spent his life working all around the world for American oil companies. But some people were born to be Texans. This is my boot collection that I've collected over the last 20 years or so. It's about 28 boots total. This is uh, me and my wife from way, way back. You can tell from the lamp chops an old, old picture. When I was a little kid growing up, even in Karachi at that time, we used to read Gene Autry comics, comic books, and Roy Rogers and, and those comic books. And then come, come to London, I find out who they really are, what they do, and then I started kind of talking and dressing like that. Even when I was in London, they would say, have you been to the United States before? I said, no, you will talk like one. I said, okay. <laughs> to think that people are calling into question people like my father, who the Star Spangled Banner just evokes so much emotion because it really means something for him. And so it, for me, it breaks my heart. We're just regular Americans. And like many regular Americans, faith plays an important part in their lives. This is the Quran that we keep on the top shelf, so we never lose sight of it or its teachings. The Jilanis look like a cross-section of the Muslim experience in the United States. From hijab-wearing Sana to her father's cultivated Texan cowboy image. They're all educated, wealthy and relatively liberal. But a decade after 9-11, the younger generation increasingly find themselves questioning their place in American society. I'm not a terrorist. I don't understand why the burden has been placed on my shoulders to have to defend things or take it upon right. ourselves. Right. You know, you haven't turned them in. Well, I don't know any terrorists to turn in. One thing that seems to come up over and over again is having to justify your religion and having to justify that you're a Muslim and an American at the same time. Learning about extremism and Islam is new. We weren't brought up with that. Mm -hmm. That's not something that we recognized in American ideals or in Islamic ideals. It just never came about. It wasn't like this. This is something new and it, it, we're having to adjust to this because when we came here 30 years ago, we were welcomed, we were the new immigrants, we were the hardworking people. It wasn't even a question of acceptance. We are this society. This year, just like every year, the Jelanis are off to the Houston Rodeo. It's one of the highlights of the calendar here. Looking at them, it's hard to see anything other than an archetypal all-American family who just so happened to be Muslim. I'd love to be a Muslim in America. I love this country. I identify with it. I don't have to think about 
my religion or my nationality. I just can be here. The general population is kind and giving and accepting overall, which is why this new surge of Islamophobia is extremely alarming, because I've never seen it like this. The Jilanis seemed about as integrated as one can get. But one of the biggest worries many Americans have is Islam's foreignness. To many, it looks, feels, and sounds like an alien culture. So how do you teach someone to be a good American and a good Muslim to forge a strong American Muslim identity? We traveled to Dallas for some answers. We were heading to an innovative school that offers children an American education and an Islamic one all at the same time. Headmaster Muhammad Diwan showed me around. This looks to me like a normal school in Britain, in the US. What's so different about it? What's so special about this? Well, first, first of all, it looks normal because it is a normal school. Uh, this is just like any other school with the addition of some extra subject matter. We teach religious studies. Uh, we emphasize on the study and memorization of the Quran. Our main focus, which we would say different from public schools, is we put significant emphasis on character education and on building up the self. And this is um, our first grade class. But here the language is English. Absolutely. Language is English throughout the day. So all subjects are taught in the English language. Even during the time in Arabic classes, the interaction between the students is in English because this is the primary language of the students. Pretty much all of our students are born here. Muhammad told me that the main aim of the institute was to ensure that future leaders of the Muslim community would not have to be brought in from overseas, but would be all American, born and bred in this country. Our statement reads, uh, raising the next generation of American Muslim scholars. And sometimes I, I like to add to that American Muslim leaders. We want to teach religion from an American perspective with the students or kids who are born and raised in America. So we want to raise scholars and imams that are born and raised here who, who understand the society and the culture. So we want our kids to take pride in the fact that we are Americans and take pride in the fact that we are Muslims, which should result in having a concern that as a Muslim, I am required to make my nation a better place and take pride in, in me being an American. Finding a modern, relevant, all-American type of Islam was a big priority in our next destination, California. This is Islamic Radio, West Coast style. I want to give a special shout out to the BBC who's BBC. currently in the uh, Hamburg. What, what, what? BBC. Wait, what? BBC. Why are you saying it like that? BBC, you gotta eat like BBC. <laughs> One Legacy Radio was set up by streetwise young Muslims in Southern California. It broadcasts online and through mobile phones. The idea behind it is to get young Muslim Americans to get uh, their voices on the airways and um, have somebody that has been born here, uh, been integrated into the society, speak for themselves. I don't think it can work where you have leadership immigrating from Muslim countries and try and impose that Middle Eastern culture and bring that culture and try and integrate it in American culture. Uh, a lot of times you find, particularly with the youth, yo man, I have committed so many sins. I have done things that are just completely wicked. Yo man, I don't think God can forgive me. The, the concept of Toba, repentance. When people say that, what the first thing they don't realize is they're already on the first path to forgiveness. Wow. They're already there, they're already one step. Our goal is to discuss some of the issues that we go through um, as American Muslim community and as a community at large. Um, social issues, 
whether it's you're talking about drugs, alcohol, sex, some a lot of things that the young people struggle with. Our values have changed. Mm -hmm. We don't understand what is right and wrong anymore. Whatever is marketed to us, whatever feels good, it just just do it now. We feel okay, just do it, just follow your desires. Right. At 28, Imam Mustafa Omar brings a young perspective to his position. He told me that when it comes to sermons at his mosque, he tries to keep it real. We're talking about the iPhone. I mean, as soon as the iPhone 4 was released, everyone was talking about that. You know, so that, that became almost half the topic of the sermon. You know, what, what difference does it make in your life? How are you going to use that phone? How are you going to misuse that phone? And what can you look out for? So we try and make things very relevant because if you're talking about camels and donkeys or something that doesn't relate to us at all, no one wants to listen to it. Even myself, I don't want to listen to it. Also in the house, spoken word poet, Brother Hussein. So be proud of who you are. Don't let the extremists become your voice. Represent the real Islam and let the people have a choice. He uses rap-style wordplay to explain Islam in a modern way to Americans who he says are basically scared of Muslims. Going and telling somebody just saying, oh yes, I'm Muslim and I pray five times a day. I don't think they're, they're necessarily concerned that I pray five times a day. They're more concerned on, are you going to you know, blow up? Are you going to kill me, bro? What, what, what is your you know, concern? What are you going to do? You know, are you going to enforce your laws on me? I think these are questions that they're concerned about. Fear and confusion surround Islam in America. I remembered that our journey across the USA began with an incident just a few miles from here with the family from Orange County who had been verbally abused. This is the bad seat. And we are in the middle of a fight for our lives, the fight for the future of our country. I mean, anytime you see a politician out there with that kind of opinion, right, you know, they're trying to gain votes. That's the first and foremost in my mind. With the September 11th anniversary and a presidential election coming up, are such incidents likely to become more frequent? The Muslim event in Orange County was organized by Waqar Saeed. The target is not just terrorism or extremism, it's mainstream Islam itself. And uh, that has allowed these groups to organize and to use that fear of Sharia and Islamophobia. And the Muslims are coming, they're going to impose Sharia in the United States of America and things like that to further their own political objectives. But in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., scaremongering and the politics of fear are nothing new. Keith Ellison is a Democratic representative for Minnesota. He is also the first Muslim to be elected to Congress. Islamophobia has been a, a vehicle for vote gathering, unfortunately. Sadly, some politicians throw red meat to their constituency group that has a need to uh, rail against, you know, the other. And uh, one of the most effective ways to demagogue an issue is to create a us and them dynamic. But it does feel like, uh, you know, uh, all those people who had to overcome prejudice in the past, uh, you know, uh, that the, today the Muslim community has to walk that same mile. It seemed to me that the events of 9-11, Islamophobia and the need to stand up to it have actually helped to shape and strengthen the American Muslim identity. In our travels across the USA, I was surprised at quite how patriotic and hopeful American Muslims were. Especially after September 11th, almost all Muslim Americans have become more conscious about what's taking place around them. So I think that's a very positive thing, is where they became self-conscious they became culturally conscious about what is it to shape an American Muslim identity inside of America. It's a necessity, it's something that we have to absolutely accomplish, and if we don't, then we're going to see ourselves caught in between two worlds. There's really nothing to be afraid of when it comes to Muslims in America. We're Americans, just like someone who's an American Christian. Um, so it just means that there's, that there's work, work to be done and, and bridges that need to be built, but it makes me feel, feel good to know that the majority of Americans all they really need is, is more education, more familiarity with real Muslims, and then they start to see that Muslims are just like them. 
I don't think there's any conflict of interest in being an American and a Muslim. There's no duality for me. I can be both simultaneously without having to choose and they're not mutually exclusive labels. And this is one of the few countries in the world where you can do that. All this made us hopeful that Islamophobia was just temporary. America had overcome bigotry in its past and perhaps it can do so again. For American Muslims, the United States remains a land of freedom and opportunity, and they see it as their country too. It's a great asset to our country that anyone of whatever color could inspire to be the president. But can anyone of any religion aspire to be the president? Well, they should. Why shouldn't some five-year-old kid who's Muslim, why shouldn't he be able to grow up and say, hey, I want to be president of the United States one day? Well, we, well he should be.